So I'm going to just jump in and talk very, fairly quickly. Um, I've got a lot of information condensed down, but because this is a, obviously a knowledgeable audience, uh, there's a lot of things I won't dwell on in the beginning, um, but uh, we will, I'm going to try to do it so we have time at the end to have questions and discussions and comments and things like that. So my whole goal here um, is to demystify energy efficiency or demystify electrification. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from lowest cost investments to the highest cost investments, at least from my experiences. So I'm going to go through LED lights and heat pump water heaters, heat pump clothes dryer, solar panels, uh, ground loop heat pump for heating and cooling, and an electric car. And so I'm going to share some numbers and direct experiences, the pros and cons with each one of those. And so as we go through this, every different, each of those six topics, I'm going to come back exactly this page and highlight which one I'm talking about next to kind of give you a context and a flow. So um, what I've learned is kind of valuable in these types of talks is to talk about what it is and what it isn't. So what it is, is, is um, I think both Lisa and Diana said, I just have a passion for using energy most efficiently. I think um, as an engineering student a long time ago, when I learned about heat pumps, I thought that's it. I just love those things. Um, it, what it is, is it's also a personal view based on real world practical user experience. It's to share what I've learned by doing uh, to help you. Um, what it isn't. It's not an advertisement for any brand. It's not to convince anyone of anything. And it's not a lot of, it's really not detailed technical jargon. I intentionally have left that off. Um, the financial paybacks uh, vary quite a bit. There's so many variables in there. So I'm not going to get into detailed financial paybacks, but as you'll see, as I go through this, I'll talk about some generalities of the investments required. Um, and clearly, you all know that energy is a very complex topic. And so this is just about actions on one home, on my home, that I'm sharing with you. So that's what it is and what it isn't. Um, also, with these types of talks, I like to kind of start with tell you what I'm going to tell you and then tell you and then tell you what I told you. And so I'm going to start with the end results here. What I'm going to tell you is all about kind of captured in these three things, a graph of the energy results of my home over 16 years, a chart over how energy was used in my home. I just never, never done the math before I started down this path. And then the third thing is, is a list of takeaways to consider. So first, the chart or the, the graph. Uh, the black line is showing total energy consumption. For the purposes of this, I've taken gas energy and converted it from therms into kilowatt hours. So they use the same same numbers here. So basically um, starting at 40,000 kilowatt hours and going down to a little bit under 10. Um, is a decrease of about 77%. Uh, the red line is the um, electrical energy usage and the gray line is gas. And so gas is where you see it going to zero. The reason it's not quite at zero in 2021 is I think I had three or four months um, of early 2021 before we actually disconnected it. So a little bit of usage there. But anyway, that's what I'm gonna, that, those are the end results. And I'll come back to that again later. Um, this is kind of a big aha. When I took a look at those numbers in the beginning, when I first started in 2004, 2005, the aha here was how much energy is used to heat homes. And, you know, my home is a uh, 1987 vintage with, you know, then current building codes, um, but fairly representative of what I think are average homes um, in terms of size and amount of insulation. Um, huge percentage in heating. And you can see um, the, just from a pie chart standpoint, what else goes in there. That was kind of a big aha because I went after lights first um, just because, you know, CFLs were available. And um, I was telling Alyssa before this talk that I was feeling a little bit self-congratulatory after getting a 25% decrease in my electrical bill um, usage um, after changing to CFLs. And then I did the whole pie chart math and got significantly humbled when I realized how little of an effect that had in total. So that's, those are the three things that um, are two of the, the graph and the uh, pie chart. A couple takeaways that I will not get into detail here, but I will um, as we go through this and the wrap up as well, but heat pumps aren't new. Um, everything you know are heat pumps. Um, in your home, and I'll come back to various things that people could do uh, proactively. Um, and this is kind of a summary of the uh, energy use in my house. Basically, it was 25% of the energy use was in electricity. The rest of it was gas, of which 90% of that was heating and the remaining amount was for hot water and for the dryer. So kind of an aha once, um, once I saw those numbers. 
The other takeaway here is that when you go to an all electric home, you eliminate carbon, eliminate carbon monoxide poisoning both potential and gas leak explosions. Um, and then the other takeaway that I got out of doing all of this was uh, from an electric car standpoint, it's great. You know, hybrids and driving electric cars are great, but it is also humbling to see how much energy, how little energy, frankly, they use in the context of heating your home. So I'll go through all those numbers um, here as we go through it. Um, and one of those ahas was the energy saved with just implementing LED lights was enough to run an electric car about 10,000 miles. You know, that's like a year for most people. So um, interesting perspective. Okay, what's electrification? I figured the best way I could illustrate it was to just take a picture outside my house. When Excel came to disconnect it, they said, well, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to cap it here or, you know, go back to the street and, oh, what do you want? And I said, well, I don't know, but why don't you just leave it there? Because if somebody wants to use it in the future or sometime after we sell the house, at least they know there's gas line coming in. So that's what they did. So the pipe on the left coming in is uh, the capped XL line and the pipe going in is the, the pipe that used to go into my house with gas. And so basically electrification is no gas, um, just running on electricity only. In my opinion, it puts the burden where it needs to be. And that is capturing carbon at the utility. You know, more and more and more as time goes on, we're gonna be doing more and more uh, renewables, but it's a lot, well, it's just not practical to capture carbon at every house, everything that burns anything. So that's basically electrification the way I look at it. Okay, I said before, I was gonna go through this uh, same outline LED lights. I'll start with Adam, just gonna gloss through this one really fast because of this crowd. But basically, you know, the advantages, it uses about a fifth of energy of incandescent bulbs. Um, and then the point about powering electric car with a savings, um, it's now cost competitive. You know, it didn't used to be, it took a long time to get to that point, you know, 15, 16 years ago when I first started quoting these in, CFLs were more expensive and then LEDs were more expensive, not the case anymore. And um, um, disposal is now much more readily handled, handled the hazardous waste sites in Metro County area. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna move quickly from that into a heat pump hot water heater, because this isn't something that is ubiquitous by any sense. Um, but I'll just, like I said, I'm not trying to advertise for anybody, but it's because it's something that I take a look at. Um, it really, to me, hit prime time when about three years ago, um, you started getting Menards ads with heat pump hot water heaters. And you thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. So I'm gonna talk about that, kind of give you a sense for it. But as I lead into that, um, here's something to think about. 80% of hot water heaters are replaced on an emergency basis. So, you know, you call up, your hot water heater went down. Usually the first thing in the morning, you get up, nothing, you're trying to get it done right away. You might want to consider doing it proactively. Um, if you've got an older hot water heater and you know it's six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old, you might want to think about doing it ahead of time if you like the concept of what I'm about to talk about, the heat pump hot water heater. Okay. So advantages, um, it's about the same size as a normal hot water heater. It uses only a third of the energy of gas or electric hot water heaters. Payback is less than a year. And it needs about a 10 by 12 foot uh, space in your basement. And so um, the technical reason for that is it just needs a certain about a thousand cubic feet of air in order to get enough heat out of the air to create the heat that you need in your hot water heater. Um, so. The cost, it's about $1,100 for a 50 gallon tank um, versus, uh, as best as I could, I just kind of did a comparison against what looked like an equivalent, um, equivalent for about for that size and that type of hot water heater, that level of it was $860. So, okay, this is what it is. Um, it's a little bit taller. It is a 50 gallon hot water heater. Most homes I think are 40 gallons, so it's 50 gallons. Um, but basically the top, oh, 30% or so of it is really the heat pump side. Um, but, you know, otherwise it's hooked in very conventionally and it's basically a, just a, I don't know, you can get it all hooked up and go and you don't think about it again. Um, so that's the heat pump hot water heater. I'm gonna talk about the heat pump clothes dryer next. Advantages. You know, when you really get down to it, the whole purpose of drying your clothes is you're trying to dehumidify them. And that's what it does. You know, as I mentioned before, uh, dehumidifiers are heat pumps. It basically dehumidifies clothes. It's 
much gentler on them than baking them. Um, it dries in a normal time if it's needed. I'm gonna come back to that, why this is an advantage. Um, and just like a heat pump hot water heater uses about a third the energy of a gas electric dryer. Disadvantages, it has two lint filters to clean. Now we're all used to cleaning the one air filter, you open it up, you pull it out, grab it out, you toss it, you're done. Um, sounds like two, uh, okay, well, it's only twice, but it's not that big a deal. Yes and no. And so I thought the best way I could, I could describe that is I'm gonna show you a little video clip of me cleaning out the second lint filter, just to kind of give you a sense of what that, what that is. It's a bit of a pain, um, I gotta say, just to be totally honest, but it's worth it um, because of the energy savings. Okay. Now the thing about dehumidifying clothes instead of baking them is it does take about two to three times longer to dry. Um, but I know at least the way I do laundry is I, I forget sometimes, you know, I put it in and then I think, oh yeah, I had something in the washer, the dryer, and I go back sometime later to, to get it done. Um, if you really need it fast, um, it has my words, a turbo, type of a function, but basically uh, it'll do a quick dry where it basically turns on the electric heat. Uh, so it becomes an electric dryer. Um, so if you need it fast, you can get it fast, um, but otherwise it will take two to three times as long to dry. Um, okay, now the other advantage of this um, is kind of, kind of fun. Um, it reduces the cold air drafts because nothing is vented outside. So what I was happiest about getting a heat pump clothes dryer is being able to plug that hole, stuff the insulation in it so that you don't have that four inch hole that, you know, in the coldest of days, you walk by your dryer and it is freezing there because it's just a pipe connected to the outside, right? You can plug that up. So I'm going to show you that visual in a second as well. Um, but basically uh, bought at a very well-known local retailer um, equivalent. Uh, these are these are not the low end uh, washer and dryers, but um, here's the pricing on them just to kind of give you a sense for it. Okay, very conventional built by Whirlpool. This look familiar? Right, I mean, how many of us have that happening? Well, so warm, humid air is exhausted outside um, from your dryer, especially, I mean, they're usually for both gas and electric, but absolutely with gas, because you need to exhaust the, the fumes. Um, but every ounce of air that's exhausted, if you think about it, leaks in from someplace. So it leaks in somewhere in your house and then it has to be heated. And so when you go outside and you take a look at how much air is going out in the middle of the winter time, when you may be humidifying, inside and heating, you're doing exactly what, need, what, you know, what you're expelling here. So it's, it's kind of crazy, especially in the Minnesota winter, to be expelling hot, humid air, um, leaking in the very coldest air that then has to be heated by your furnace. So that's very satisfying to be able to stop that because nothing goes out. So therefore nothing leaks in, right? So um, what goes in stays, or it, it's, it's conserved, so to speak. Okay. Cleaning two lint filters. Uh, picture is worth a thousand words, maybe worth 10,000 words to show you a video. So there's two different lint filters. Uh, first one is like our most normal dryers, place right in the door, just basically clean it out like that. Put it back in. The second filter down here. Hold on. Outside, as well as on the inside. Many times what we do is just vacuum that to make it clean, but for purposes of the demo, I'll just show you. Okay. So I'm gonna move on from there quickly and go on to solar panels uh, with this group. We don't have to spend a lot of time here. Advantages, no maintenance, they last a long time. There's a lot of different options in how you buy them. You can buy them, well, there's a lot of options, um, including no capital upfront. Um, the payback is in the range of 10 years. Um, I think the installed cost right now, rule of thumb is about $3 a watt, um, which solar panels are all different sizes, but just in rough numbers, it's about $1,000 per panel that you see outside and of course there's some tax credits that will be expiring uh, next year if they're not 
reinstated. Disadvantages, I don't know, appearance? <laughs> I don't, I just don't think there's any disadvantages to solar panels. When you have that kind of a payback period and you don't have to do anything to it, but um, so appearance could be it. These are the 12 panels I have on my house. Um, I don't see it as a big disadvantage. Okay, I'm not gonna spend time there. I'm gonna spend some time on this one, the ground loop heat pump for heating and cooling, because this is many times it's called a geothermal heat pump, um, synonymous. Um, those are pretty much the same thing. Technically though, it is a ground loop heat pump. So let's talk about advantages and disadvantages. Um, so when you're in your basement, um, it fits about the same space as a furnace. Uh, but there's nothing outside. There's no big box outside, right? Um, it's extremely, extremely efficient. Um, I mean, my, my cost of electricity for everything, I mean, for everything, heating, cooling, plug loads, refrigerators, everything else, is $89 a month average um, for all the electricity. Um, it provides both heating and air conditioning. Disadvantages, it's expensive, you know, especially in the city because you don't have large spaces. You have to go down with wells. Um, it can cost two to three times as much as replacing a furnace air conditioner combination. Um, heat pumps don't provide air at quite the same temperature as a gas furnace, for example. And so, you know, the lower the temperature air, the more of it you need. And so in a, in a home that's designed for gas furnaces, you have to put more air through it. So you can hear more air signs in the ductwork. Um, uh, another advantage is that it connects to the ducts in the house in the same way as a gas furnace. And so here's a picture. Um, here's the ground loop heat pump. Uh, as you can see in the top part there, it connects in. Um, if you go home and take a look at your furnace, pretty much in the same way into the supply air ductwork. Um, the, <clears throat> when I said it eliminates the unit outside, the picture on the left is, you know, how many, anyone who has central air conditioning has one of those outside? Nothing, there's nothing out there because you don't need it. Um, those two white, you can see two white PVC elbows in the lower right hand corner there. Those are uh, the pipe coming in from underground and the pipe going back underground. So in my house, I have 10 100 foot deep wells that are all connected um, and come in through basically those two pipes. And that's where um, the water comes in that the heat is obtained in order to heat your home. Now, this is, a hard thing to explain on how does a heat pump work, right? Um, and so the best in, um, explanation I heard, it was not mine, it was somebody who suggested this. I thought that's a great way to do it. We've all stood in front of the refrigerator, you've opened the door, you're trying to figure out, you know, what this to eat, whatever. Um, and it's, when it goes on, you feel warm air coming out on your toes. That is a heat pump, right? And so when you think about it, your refrigerator is anywhere from 37 to 40 degrees usually and your freezer is usually about zero, and it's taking heat out, you know, is out of those foods, and it's rejecting it by your toes. And that is what a geothermal or ground loop heat pump is. With the water underground is year round about 50 to 55 degrees. That's a lot warmer actually than the food in your refrigerator. So there's, there's all sorts of heat in 50 to 55 degree water. And so that's how um, just, probably the best way to walk away with a sense for at least how, how it works. How can you provide heat uh, from these two little water pipes coming in? Okay, I am going to move on to the electric car. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to get through this quickly to allow enough time for uh, questions and discussion. It's kind of a broad overview of these things. Um, so um, from my perspective, advantages, how far can you go? And, Obviously, it depends on manufacturer and a lot of other variables there, but typically temperature being one of them. Uh, colder the temperature, the harder it is to go farther. Um, typically, two to 300 miles. Um, it costs about two and a half cents per mile to run. Incredibly inexpensive. Um, and the vast majority of my trips are much less than 60 miles. You know, you just, just, they just are. I think that's the case for most people. Um, it's easy uh, to just plug it in at night. It's a lot easier than in gas. Station stop is a lot cleaner. You know, you don't get gas on your hands, et cetera. Um, disadvantages. Um, it can take eight hours to fully charge at home, assuming you have two, 240, 240 volt uh, connection available. Um, you can't easily or quickly fill it up like gas. And so it creates a range anxiety, you know. So if you're getting down and charge and or you try to drive it on a longer trip, you know, you're, you're watching it. 
um, even though I've taken it for you know long trips um, in a loop or something like that, and I know I've got the range, and I know based on the meat or you know the gauge how much I have to go, I'm still always doing the math in my head just to make sure. Um, at least in the beginning. Now I don't worry about it so much, but I know when I first got it, I was doing the math all the time. You just don't want to be stuck because you can't fill it up quickly. Um, a disadvantage is is, is availability. Um, you know, I think. I just read that in 2021 in Europe, the number of electric cars exceeded the number of diesel cars sold in Europe in 2021. That's fantastic. But as we all know, all the supply chain things are affecting a lot of things, and this is uh, certainly one of them. Um, but because of the growing popularity here, it is affecting the availability. Um, you do need a charging station. So here's a bunch of concepts out there that people have read or heard about. I'm going to try to bring it home um, by showing you some actual examples of all of this. Um, I got to say, I'm a bit of a car guy. When I was in school, I went to school as a mechanical engineer because I wanted to design cars um, and ended up not doing that. But um, they're fun. They are fast. I mean, they accelerate. They handle well. With the, with the weight of the batteries on the bottom, you can take corners and, you know, not, not lean all that much. It's good. They're fun to drive. Um, and very little maintenance. It, the first time, I think it was a 15,000 mile check thing popped up. And I thought, well, I wonder what needs to be done there. So I opened the manual and I looked up and it said, replace the pollen filter, the cabin pollen filter. And I thought, well, that can't be too hard. And so I, you know, YouTubed it. And sure enough, it wasn't. You had to unscrew two things and then pull it out, put the new one in, screw two things back in and done. Um, it was a 10 minute exercise, uh, very little maintenance because there's just not a lot of moving parts in electric cars. So just a quick overview of the advantages and disadvantages. Now I want to show you some pictures and a couple videos. Okay, a charging station. Um, cost about $1,300. I'm sure that and they're very all over the place, you know, based on all sorts of factors, but um, about $1,300. Um, frankly, um, because I was having some upgrade work done on my solar panels, the electrician who was doing some of the reconnection work on it um, did this install as well. Um, he said, you know, the, actually the easiest thing to do is if you know what charging station you want, you can just order on Amazon and I'll just install it. And that's what we did. So I ordered it, got it, boom, boom. Uh, he installed it and uh, I was good to go. Um, it's a lot easier and cleaner, as I mentioned before, than filling gas in a car. And typically, I just plug it in, you know, overnight. I, I kind of, over time now, you know, if it's down to 80% or 75%, and I know I'm not going to be driving all over the place the next day, I don't plug it in. I let it kind of work its way down, but um, not a big deal. Okay, so on the left is what looks like when you open the hatch, um, the electric vehicle unplugged without the charging in it, and the right is a picture of it with the charger in it, okay? So that kind of helps, but it might help even more to watch it. The door on the farm and take off the cap. And similarly, uncharge it or unplug it. Not a big deal. I'd have to say that one of the biggest surprises I had because um, this was a bit of an experiment. To, to go the electric car route. And I told my wife, this is, this is on me. So you can take the, the gas driven car. I'll take, the, I'll take this one and live with the pros and cons, right? And um, what I found over time was that's actually, this is the car now she chooses to take. Um, she loves never having to go to the gas station and you can see what the plugging and unplugging process is. It's, it's just so easy. And um, so anyway, just a few pictures and a video hopefully that relate. Um, give a little more background to the wording that I've gone through. So the results, you saw this um, before, but you can see how, um, I'll point out a couple things here. 
One is the red line, the electrical charge there. I had two years of 2004 and 2005 that I used as kind of the baseline years because they were fairly stable, you know, within, within reason. And so fortunately I had kept um, the XL bills from that point. So I've got XL bills going all the way back to 2004 um, and a spreadsheet <laughs> that have all of these numbers in them. But it's interesting over time to see, um, you know, the impact of um, buying CFLs. You know, I didn't start out like thinking that this was going to be a plan that I was going to electrify. Um, I started with, oh, you know, CFLs were out when, when Excel first came out with them back in the 1990s. I mean, they're huge. They were like that long and it wouldn't fit inside lamps, you know, but I bought some anyway and I was trying to get those to work. There weren't a lot of places you could put them. But when they started to come out with the CFLs that you could put in lamps and use all over the house, I started buying them. And so I um, started buying them in 2006 and two, over 2006, 2007. And you can see the numbers started to decrease where it took that long when I mentioned earlier, about a 25% drop in consumption was give or take about 10,000 kilowatt hours used before. And it dropped to about 7,500 kilowatt hours after I replaced all the bulbs in the house. So that was interesting. I, you know, as I mentioned before, I thought, oh, that's, that's cool. Um, in 2010, in August or so, um, is when the ground loop heat pump went in. And you can just see by 2011, that's what caused the plummet in gas consumption. So when I mentioned before that a ground loop heat pump is incredibly efficient, it is. You can see the drop in, I mean, basically a 90% drop in uh, gas consumption, um, natural gas. And you can see it go up, right? Starting in 2010, and then it peaked in 2011. Um, went up, the electrical consumption went up to compensate. It's interesting to me though, it went up to about the same point it was at in 2005. So fascinating um, how efficient that move was. Um, and so as you go on from there, um, ended up putting solar in in 2012. So that's what caused the next drop. And you can see it kind of, you know, it was a combination of things. Those dropped off, but then as time went on, I added the um, uh, heat pump clothes dryer, heat pump hot water heater. So the bottom line, when you kind of step back and take a look at it, is the electrical line, you know, it's kind of flat <laughs> when you go across. I mean, it's not quite, but it's just a little bit under 10,000 and before it was a little above 10,000. Um, but now that's all the electrical consumption. So when I talk about the fact that it dropped from about 40,000 down to less than 10,000, that's, that's how it came together. Um, and it was fascinating to get to that point to, to see the actual results. Okay, um, I pointed this out before. These numbers all came from the base years of 2004 and 2005, just because I was curious. Um, and what I learned, um, the reason why I know with certainty that the heating one is that size is because you know when you stop providing um, heating with um, a gas furnace, you can just see the drop. You know, I was averaging about 100 therms a year, sometimes 110, and it went down to about, I'm sorry, 1,000 uh, therms a year, and it dropped down to about 100. So that's the 90% drop in gas consumption, and that was solely due to not heating with gas anymore. So the numbers are pretty straightforward. Um, but once I put them on a you know pie chart and looked at the, what they actually are, it frankly, it, it kind of woke me up, I guess. I thought, Huh. It's interesting when it's your own house and you've done these things and you see how much actually goes into it. Okay. Takeaways. I'm going to, again, dwell on this just a little bit more here. Um, so heat pumps are not new. All of these things, refrigerator, dehumidifiers, air conditioners, they're all heat pumps. It's not a new concept. It's a technology that's been around for 100 years. In your home, I'd consider things like LED lights. And, you know, these things are things that you guys talk about a lot, so I'm not going to go through these. Um, yeah, just not going to go through it other than to reemphasize the point that when you think about your hot water heater, um, you might want to think about it ahead of time, get it ready for 240 volt. You need 240 volt, um, wiring brought close to where the hot water heater is going to be. Um, and that's the key thing as far as getting ready for it. If you have that right there, when your heat, when your water heater goes, if you wait until then, you can pretty quickly get it replaced with a heat pump, hot water heater. Again, three times the efficiency. Okay, um, I think I've emphasized this quite a bit, so I'm not going to spend any more time on the energy use. Um, the safety thing, um, wow, I mean, you still read about houses every now and then you hear about a house blowing up because of a gas leak someplace. 
Um, and then carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, just recently we had one in the Twin City area. Um, it seems like it was one of the Western um, ring suburbs, as I recall, but horrible tragedy with a family, um, all the entire family because of carbon monoxide poisoning. There's nothing burning in the house, so there is no carbon monoxide. Um, and the big aha here was, wow, I just, when you take a look, you know, here's a rough number. So the electric car um, that I'm using has about a four mile per kilowatt hour efficiency. And so, you know, when you do the math on that, um, that's where I come out with a drop of 2,500 kilowatt hours just due to the bulbs, multiply that by four and that's 10,000 miles, right? And so, um, it's also not much compared to the energy the pie chart that I showed earlier on or a couple of times on uh, heating your home. So those are the key takeaways. 